So, a week and a half ago, I spent the beginning of a video picking apart NVIDIA's clearly cherry-picked benchmarks, and to the surprise of no one, especially me, a bunch of people called me a fanboy and downvoted it for pointing out what I thought were obvious discrepancies in NVIDIA's own numbers. Well, what happened then? NVIDIA claimed the 3080 was double the 2080. I pointed out their own numbers showed it was 80% at most and likely cherry-picked. It was probably even below a 70% increase. And I also emphasized things like the fact that that paid Digital Foundry video clearly cherry-picked settings of their own. For example, in that Battlefield 5 demo, remember Battlefield 5 was a ray tracing showcase game around Turing's launch, all of a sudden had ray tracing turned off. And you know why? Well, because when you turn on ray tracing, it uses more VRAM. And if you turn it off, well, it should use more than eight gigabytes, but not 10. That's right, at least in that example, Battlefield 5 was cherry picked to go a bit over 30, uh, 2080 VRAM amounts, but stay under the 3080s cherry picking at its best. But now, here we are. We are at the official Ampere launch and the numbers are in. And it's pretty underwhelming if you ask me. No, the 3080 is not double the 2080's performance. It's not even 80% better. It's not even 70% better. It's like 65% better than a 2080. And that leaves it about 30% better overall, depending on the game and resolution, than the 2080 Ti. If anything, I went easy on NVIDIA with my analysis of their cherry-picked results. And let's actually look at some of these lower resolutions here. I don't want to dwell on 1080p because I do think it's mostly a waste of time with high-end cards, but some of these games could use a bit more frame rates, especially when we go to 1440p, which, well, is not a super high resolution. This is the resolution most people use, and there are plenty of games like Gears of War 5 where you're not getting 120 hertz, and you would expect that performance boost to happen, but there's no way around it. I couldn't have been more right with that piece of information regarding the fact that Ampere just only seems to really scale effectively in 4K. Now, you may say 20% is a lot, but I don't think it is when it's using 30% more energy. And so what we can say is in 4K, it basically gets the same amount more performance versus Turing as you get more power usage. But that means if it's only really good at 4K, I have a major problem with the 3080. It only has 10 gigabytes of VRAM, and that's already a problem, as I pointed out in Battlefield 5. And Steve Walton himself, in the Hardware Unbox review, found the same thing with Doom Eternal. They had clearly cherry-picked results to show in their showcase on Digital Foundry a setting that was using more than 8 gigabytes of RAM, but not quite 10 gigabytes. So we already have plenty of games using at least 10 gigabytes. If this card is only good at 4K, I just don't see 10 gigabytes cutting it. And... I guess the one somewhat good thing I saw was in Minecraft RTX. We actually did see a much higher ray tracing boost in this game than rasterization boost in most games. And so, yeah, maybe Ampere will get more of a ray tracing boost than rasterization. But it's still not anywhere near what I was told and I reported. And that's unfortunate. It just needs to be more than 80%. It needs to be more than double the Turing ray tracing performance. Or it's still a gimmick. And on the Gamers Nexus review, let us also look at their overclocking results. They talk about how there wasn't a lot of headroom, but remember what I told you guys. There is a lot of headroom if you're willing to use over 400 watts. Their results were limited by the 370 watt limit on their Founders Edition cards. So yes, I think Ampere will overclock well with some AIB models, but you're going to be using as much energy as a dual graphics card. Look, at the end of the day, when I look at these final results, I just have to kind of say the same thing Linus Tech Tips opened up in his review. Why did NVIDIA make such insane claims? On its own merits, I think Ampere would have been received incredibly well. They didn't raise prices over Turing, although I would argue they're not any better at the end of the day. And they were bringing you a higher performance boost than Turing with some cool new features. But you know what? They overpromised and they underdelivered, just like I would say Vega did. And the conclusion I'm forced to come to is they would only do this if they wanted a bunch of people to impulse buy these cards before the competition shows up. And unfortunately, I do have to emphasize that that report I put out 
of NVIDIA intentionally jacking up prices over October is 100% true, and I even have more info. Look, if you got the Founders Edition with that beautiful cooler for $700, I think that's an okay price. My opinion hasn't changed on that. I think the 3080 is a great card at $700 as long as it's cooled adequately. But what I'm told is that for the first 14 days of sales, AIBs will get almost $50 cash back per card sold in September, and this is to make up for the closer than wanted margins in that first month of sales. For those who say this is insane, just remember that Intel does this to AMD all the time with OEMs. So you know those above MSRP public, not a conspiracy, public prices we've already seen? That would go up at least $45 in October whether these cards sell out or not. There's just no way around it. The RTX 3080, if you weren't lucky enough to get that beautiful Founders Edition, is an $800 or more card, and it doesn't even have enough VRAM for 4K, the only resolution it actually shines at over Turing. And that is just the truth. Look, I've grown a lot lately over the past few months, and looking at the numbers, there's been a lot of viewers in those months. Numbers would just dictate that many of you must lean towards NVIDIA. It has to be true, and I acknowledge that. But at the same time, I'm never going to compromise my honest opinion. I'm never going to just say, oh, let me tone this down so the AM dumbs don't get mad at me. But in this circumstance, you know, it's unfortunately one of those circumstances. I just have to say that even when I look at things like the mining performance, it's not that impressive. It doesn't seem to be any better at mining, at least around launch, than my Radeon 7, at least in terms of performance per watt. I'm sure you can push it really hard and get over 100 mega hash and yada, yada, yada in Ethereum, but that for the power usage, it's really not better. And so what can I really say about Ampere? You know, the fact of the matter is it seems to bring you more performance versus Turing but it does so with that much more power usage. I don't think this is gonna be great in laptops. And I guess at the very least, I have data to suggest the professional cards are the best yields and actually are boosting higher at lower power usage. So those might be good. But when it comes to the gaming cards, they're just trying to shovel garbage and they're trying to make it look like they lowered prices when they haven't. I am unfortunately underwhelmed and Ampere has underperformed my expectations, and anyone who listened to Broken Silicons a couple of months ago will know that I said over and over to guests and my brother on the podcast, I'm really excited about Ampere. I might get one, but unless it's the Founders Edition for $700, I'm not getting that 3080, and I don't recommend anyone else do as well. But anyways, the last thing I have to say is that there's definitely an opening here for AMD. I am very confident they can make big waves this week fall. As long as AMD can tie NVIDIA in 1440p, and it seems like they should be able to at least do that, they will also bring you 16 gigabytes in their top consumer card at least. And while it might lose in 4K by 10% or more, although to be honest, I'm not sure it will lose in 4K, even if it does, at least it has enough VRAM long term. And you know what the funny thing is? Look at that cooler design. Does that look like AMD isn't pushing the top card at least match the 3080 like both me and uh, Igor have reported? I mean, we already know that the Xbox Series X uses about the same amount of energy as a last-gen console from their hot chips presentation. And I already knew, like Igor did, that AMD was targeting around 250 to 285 watts for their standard big Navi that would have more compute units than the Xbox. When I see this triple fan design here, I can tell that AMD is pushing this, and I just do not think they would push this card more than we expected unless they knew it had a purpose, and that purpose is to compete in the high end, and in the high end while actually having enough VRAM. And speaking of VRAM, I think it's time I fess up about some of the specs I know about Big Navi. I hinted at them in that recent, you know, NVIDIA price manipulation article in video, but I held back a bit until I could gain a bit more confidence, and frankly, though, I'm seeing other people start to confirm some things I knew a week ago, and so I feel I should at least tell you guys some of what I know, or it won't even be news anymore. So, as far as I'm aware, Navi 21 uses GDR6 non-X in its consumer versions at the very least, 
And that's over a 256-bit bus in all likelihood. No, not 384-bit. I'm under the impression that there was possibly a 384-bit model, although honestly it could have been bad information, but that that model was canceled. And there would be some of you that go, oh, AMD cancels the 384-bit model version that they were testing of Big Navi. That's bad news. No, it's it's probably good news. The performance estimates I'm told about Top Navi haven't changed, guys. Haven't changed at all from the past couple of months. And so I just think Big Navi can make do with far less bandwidth than Ampere can. I'm honestly under the impression that there's a decent chance RDNA 2 could be a Maxwell moment for AMD. Or if anything, it should probably be called an HD 5000 series moment. And there were a lot of hints of this drop by Mark Cerny. Actually, let's let's take a listen to part of that Road to PS5 video that so many people seem to not have paid enough attention to. What does that mean? AMD is continuously improving and revising their tech. For RDNA 2, their goals were, roughly speaking, to reduce power consumption by re-architecting the GPU to put data close to where it's needed, to optimize the GPU for performance, and to add a new, more advanced feature set. But that feature set is malleable, which is to say that we have our own needs for PlayStation, and that can factor into what the AMD roadmap becomes. So collaboration is born. If we bring concepts to AMD that are felt to be widely useful, then they can be adopted into RDNA 2 and used broadly, including in PC GPUs. If the ideas are sufficiently specific to what we're trying to accomplish, like the GPU cache scrubbers I was talking about, then they end up being just for us. If you see a similar discrete GPU available as a PC card at roughly the same time as we release our console, that means our collaboration with AMD succeeded uh, in producing technology useful in both worlds. It doesn't mean that we as Sony simply incorporated the PC part into our console. I am told by my best source that AMD has made massive overhauls to their memory management systems. One that should make 256-bit of normal GDR6 enough for a high-end graphics card. And if I'm being honest, I think that's likely a massive piece of L4 cache or something similar. I'm not 100% sure on that, but that's what I believe is going on. And I believe that will be enough for 60 compute units, which I will just confirm. I believe one of the main consumer models has just 60 compute units, but they are clocked faster than RDNA 1, and they are with much higher IPC. And remember, 60 compute units is already 50% more than 40 before you add in higher IPC and clock speed. And the other thing I'm sure about this 60 CU model is that that's one of the ones around 250 to 275 watts, likely the one briefed on AIBs a while ago. 60 CUs is not the full die. And sources are being pretty cagey about what the full die is. It could be 80 compute units, honestly. I think it probably is, but I just have to tell you guys, I'm being honest, people are being weird about what the top die is and about what's in it. AMD is being quiet out of confidence at this point, I'm sure. And like I said in this video here, as I tried to explain, I don't think AMD even needs to beat the 3080 to make it look silly. The 3080 only exceeds in 4K. It only has 10 gigabytes of VRAM, and that's not enough for 4K. If AMD manages to match the 3080 at lower resolutions, which most people use, but then in 4K actually have enough VRAM for a lower price and lower energy, I think AMD's got a winner on their hands. And that's basically what I know. I have to be honest, I can't recommend Ampere for anything above MSRPs, but if you get it for MSRP, especially with the Founders Edition, it's fine. It's honestly fine. And if you weren't able to get one, which most people weren't, just like I said, honestly, I think RDNA 2 is something you just should not be dismissing right now. It's going to be incredibly impressive. And I believe I will know RDNA 2's actual performance numbers pretty soon. So don't forget to subscribe to my channel and ring the belt button to not miss all of that coverage coming very soon. And of course, remember to subscribe to Broken Silicon on your preferred podcast app of choice. Support me on Patreon if you want to get that podcast early and ad-free and get exclusive podcasts every week. And of course, as always, 
Thank you for watching.